So we want to secure our data when we send it between our web browser and web server, and we saw that the way to do that is to use HTTP, the, the web browsing protocol, but on top of SSL, the secure sockets layer. Or the, the newer name, or the newer version is called Transport Layer Security, TLS. So combining HTTP with SSL or TLS is referred to as HTTPS, and we use it on a regular basis. Uh, we'll show, I'll show another example of using that uh, today, and we'll look at one aspect of how to do the authentication. We'll see that HTTPS will do the encryption. That is, SSL allows us to, before we send the, the request and the response, we encrypt it so no one can see the request or response. But before we do that, there are two things that we need to... Uh, perform, we need to first, we're going to use symmetric key encryption to encrypt, so we need to exchange a key, a secret key between server and client. That is, for the client, your web browser to encrypt, it needs a key to encrypt, and the server must have that key so it can decrypt. So there's some key exchange. And the other aspect is the authentication, which is done in usually two parts. When you visit a website, and let's say you log into that website, there's some authentication so that the web server knows it's you that's visiting the website. And the normal way for the web server to authenticate you, the client, is using some username and password. So we use that on a daily basis. We log into websites. The other part is that when you visit a website, you often want to be sure that the website you're visiting is the real website and not someone pretending to be that website. For example, you log into your bank website, you want to be sure when you, especially when you uh, exchange confidential information with it, you want to be sure that that is the, the bank's website. It's not someone doing some attack and pretending to be the website. So you want to authenticate the server. And that's what we'll focus on today, is the way that the browser authenticates the server and the concept is to use certificates or digital certificates. But before we look at them, digital certificates, let's go through another example of HTTPS, or first HTTP and then HTTPS. I've set up, I've set up a virtual network which has just three nodes. And I'll draw it. That's not it. The, the example I'll go through looks like this. We have uh, node 1. No need to draw this. This is just an example that you may see a similar one in, in some of the homework tasks. Three nodes. So this is our router, this will be our web server, and this will be the web browser. So three nodes in this simple network, and what I've done is I've already set up the, the nodes so that node 1 can contact node 3, and I've set up a fake website on the web server, just some, some web pages that we can use to demonstrate some, some, uh, some, some security issues. And I've actually set it up so that we can use HTTPS. So we use both HTTP to access the browser to the web server, and then again we access the same website but using HTTPS and see the difference. Uh, on my web when I say this computer one is the web browser, I mean that computer is running the web browser. Okay, so node one runs the web browser. What's a web browser we can use? Firefox, okay, so you know many web browsers. On our virtual nodes, when you've set up virtual, the virtual network with node one, node two, and so on, we can't use Firefox directly because there's no GUI on those virtual nodes. You, you only have the terminal. There's no graphical interface because it's just set up as a very simple node so that we don't need many resources. So uh, what web browser can I use? How can I use a web browser without some graphical interface? 
I need some text-based web browser. That's one option. Links is one that we can use. Uh, we'll see a couple of other options. But what I can do and what I've done, and it's, not, it's only to make the, the demo a little bit easier, uh, I've set it up so that these are the virtual nodes and think this is my laptop. These are actually running on my laptop, but we can think of them as three, four different, four different operating systems. My laptop and then the operating systems of each of the nodes. I've set up so that I can run my browser on here and it pretends as if it's on node one. Firefox is FF. So I run my web browser, my normal web browser on my laptop. I'll show you in a moment. And when I browse via that, I've set it up so that when I visit a website, the, webs the request will be sent from node one and we'll see to node three. And when the response comes back, it will go to node one and then to my real browser. It's just for the demos so that we can actually use Firefox as opposed to the text-based browser links. The way that I set that up is to use some, some tunneling, but that's not important for this topic. So when I access my browser, think I'm on node one. So I've got the nodes. Uh, we will not do much on them. We may capture on node two. Node three is the web server. The web server is there running. Apache web server is running there. There's some web pages that we'll, we'll visit in a moment. And uh, so there's nothing to view on node three. Our node two is just the router, so we may capture some packets and just see what's being sent to and from the nodes. And node one is our web browser, but for the web browser, we'll view from my actual uh, Firefox. So first, let's visit the website. But on node two, I'll capture the packets here. Now, we're a bit hard to see because there are many packets. I think many of you know already we can capture packets being sent using different software. One of them we, we use is TCP dump and it captures packets. This long command of using TCP dump uh, simply filters out all the packets which are unnecessary for me to show you. It, what it does is shows just the HTTP packets. That's all I want to look at in this case, the HTTP request and the response. Uh, the TCP port 80 means show only to port 80 and those other strange characters here mean ignore all the acts and so on. So just show the HTTP messages. We'll start that running. So it should print out but I'll show you in detail as we go. And now I'll open my browser. It is open and I'll visit the website and I've set up a fake website on node 3 it's for, a, a, say, for a university, so HTTP. And the domain name I've set up, a fake one, myuni.edu. So it's a university website. And uh, it's for students to access their grades, OK? OK, so there's the front page. I developed it myself, so it's a very advanced user interface. Uh, it's for students to log in and view their grades for the, for the different courses. Uh, why can't you see that straight on? May we move this? <laughs> Excuse me. It can change the view. <laughs> Not quite. Yes, you can try. That's close. You can try the high-tech approach. As long as we can see the side, side of the screen. So this is the, the website. It's OK. OK, perfect. Thank you. 
So there's our website. We're capturing, I hope. The capture will look in detail at some of the other packets, but the capture of TCP dump shows this was the GET request. You may, may not see the details here. It's not so important, but this is the GET request saying, I want to get the URL, which in the, the path was slash grades. And this is the response saying the response is OK. And here is the web page in the response. Here's the actual HTML. Okay, so this is just showing that the router sees the actual URL requested and the, re the web page that comes back. And in this system, we can log in. And the login is implemented as a form. Everyone knows how to implement a login for a web page. Okay, so just a, in this case, it's just a HTML form. If you look at the source code of the, the web page, it may be a bit hard to see, but the, it's a form where the action, when we, when we press the submit button, it would take the username and the password and submit them, essentially using what we call the post method. The post method is a part of HTTP that we use to send data to the server, to submit data to the server. The data will be received by the server, processed, and then the web page will be sent back. So we've mainly seen a GET request in HTTP. We get a web page. Post is used for sending data to the server, commonly used to submit form data. So I've got some users on here, some students and their passwords. Can someone see the password? Why not? Right, it's hidden. So a u the user interface hides the password as you type it. Why? So no one can see and look over your shoulder or on the screen and see your password as you type. And I know many of you, some of you have had troubles on Linux or on Unix-based systems. You log in and you don't even see the dots or stars. Nothing's displayed. It's just a, a, a form of hiding the password. But it may be inconvenient because you don't know what you're typing and if you've made a mistake. That's a part of the login system. And we press login. And now I'm logged in as this user with ID 5 with nine zeros, and I can view my grades. And it's a, I can select the course that I've got the grades for. This is the student logged in. And I can see that this student's getting a, or a B plus for this course. So this web-based system, we'll see it in some other, in the next topic as well, we'll see some web attacks on this website, but for now we're just using it to demonstrate HTTPS, or first HTTP. Back to the capture. Actually, I'll log out. And here we should have all of our packets which were captured by the router while I was sending those requests and response between web browser and web server. And Rather than scrolling up and trying to see it, uh, actually, we may be able to quickly see it. If we scroll up, so I'm just scrolling up. This was the web page form, the login form, and then we sent a post request. So when I press the submit button, that triggered my web browser to send a request to the server and it was a post request. And this was captured by the router and the important point, inside that post request, if I find it again, is the username and password. Okay, so with the authentication of the client in this case, 
using a form, the username and password are sent in the clear in that post request. So th this is just another illustration of why not to use HTTP for sending confidential information. Because anyone on the internet can easily capture this request and has captured the password of the student, which is in fact student in this case. So this motivates the need for HTTPS. These messages sent between the browser and server should be encrypted so that someone who intercepts and captures them cannot see this information. They cannot see the username and password. Whenever you log into a website, make sure it's using HTTPS. Not uh, the form to log in is not using HTTP because in, if it is, your password's sent in the clear. I'll stop the capture and start again because we'll try it with HTTPS. And I, what port number do we use if we're using HTTPS? The web server uses a different port number, 443. So my web server think there are two instances on my node 3. One is the normal HTTP web server listening on port 80 and the other is the HTTPS web server listening on port 443. So what I'm going to do on the router now is capture on port 443 and see all the messages sent between browser and server. We'll leave that running. And I'll just close this and open it again. And we'll open our browser again and visit the same website. We visit the same website, but HTTPS is the scheme for accessing this website. The only difference is the S there. And I press enter, and what happens? Has anyone seen this before? Yes. What does it mean? Unfast. Right. What's not trusted about it? Unfast. Who's not trusting who? Trusting server. Right. The web browser, my client, doesn't trust the server. Or it cannot prove, or, or it's got no way to know whether this is the real server or if it's someone pretending to be the server for myuni.edu. So what we want to do in this topic is see, well, why does this come up? How do we avoid it? And, and what the mechanism is used to, to prove the trust or, or to provide trust of the server. So what do you do here? You say, I understand the risks. I, I trust it. And we'll talk about why you won't do that in the future. And we'll add an exception. Let's confirm. All right, now I've got my website. So we'll come back to that. What happened there? And I log in. And the password. It logs in, I can view my grades. The point here is that this is the capture of the packets between the browser and web server. You won't be able to find the username and password in here. This is just showing it. Uh, it's all encrypted. So all we see is random characters. There are, for example, this is a packet from the web server, port 443, to my browser. What's inside it in terms of the HTTP response? I don't know. Similar, the request is somewhere in there. What was the username and password sent? 
I don't know in this case because it's encrypted. So the encryption provides the confidentiality of our data. But as we saw, there's an issue. When we visited the website the first time, there was this warning. We cannot trust the server. So we want to look at how, how does the browser get to trust the server. So back to here. So we use HTTPS. It provides the encryption to, for the server to trust the client. That is, for the server to know it's the right student, they use the password. The student must enter the correct password to identify themselves. So that's one form of authentication. We just use normal HTTP or a HTML form, for example. But for the server, or for the client to trust the server, we use one part of SSL and we use a certificate. So let's look at the certificates. Digital certificates. Before we look at digital certificates, uh, maybe you don't have it. How do we, what about digital signatures? Can ever, anyone remember digital signatures? An equation? Okay, so write an equation for your digital signature or think about what information do you use to sign something? What, what keys or what information do we use for digital signatures? Right, we need to remember we use our private key to sign something. We, we've studied a bit earlier, but let's just remind ourselves of public key cryptography and how that's used for a digital signature. Remember, with public key crypto, we all have a key pair. For example, user A has a key pair, the, the public key of user A and the private key of user A, and other users have their own key pair. The public can be told to anyone else. The private must be kept secret. So we can usually encrypt using one of the two keys in the key pair. If I want confidentiality, The public key of the receiver. Good. That is, I want to send a message to someone so that no one else can read that message. A wants to send to B a confidential message. Then they will encrypt that message using the public key of the receiver. So we've studied this in, in the, the first or the second topic on cryptography, but just a reminder, if I encrypt, if A encrypts the message with the public key of B and sends that ciphertext to B, the only person who can successfully decrypt is B, because only B has the private key. You can only decrypt with the corresponding key in the key pair. So that if someone intercepts this, they cannot decrypt it. That's confidentiality. They will not be able to see the message. But the other way that we use public key cryptography is for authentication or, uh, right, in general, authentication. And a specific case is a digital signature. If A wants to authenticate themselves to B, we use our private key, the private key of A. Good. The concept is that A encrypts the message with their own private key. B gets that. If it successfully decrypts with A's public key, then that implies the message must have been encrypted with A's private key 
which implies it must have come from A, because no one else has A's private key. If it doesn't successfully decrypt with A's public key, B knows it's not from A. So this is the use of public key cryptography for authentication. Anyone can see the message. It's easy to decrypt this. You just need the public key of A, which by definition everyone can have. But only one person can create a message that will be decrypted with a public key of A, and that is A. So that's the authentication there. And a specific instance of that is a digital signature where in practice we incorporate a hash to make it more convenient. So we'll just remind ourselves of a digital signature which is also performing authentication. A wants to sign a message and send it to B. We think we have some message and that we want to send to B and we attach a signature. I'll denote as S, the signature, where the S is calculated what is the signature equal, we encrypt using the private key of A the hash of the message. So similar concept to the authentication, we encrypt with the sender's private key. I sign it with my private key. I sign it with a thing that only I have. But in practice, what we do is we don't encrypt the entire message. We only need to encrypt a hash of the message because the properties of the hash functions means that if the message is changed, then the hash value will not match when we verify it, receive a B. So we can say the signature of a message is the encrypted hash value when we use the private key of the sender. What B does, they receive the message they use A's public key to decrypt this. We hash the received message and compare to the received hash value. If they match, good. If they don't match, something's gone wrong. Don't trust it. All right, everyone rem remembers from before the med term. Good. Any questions? encrypt with the private key for authentication. In a specific case, encrypt the hash value of the message with the private key for a digital signature. And we'll see how that is used in certificates for web browsing. It's the similar concept. We want to, as the, as the web browser, I, when I receive something from the web server, I want to be sure first that it is the right web server. So we'll use these concepts to, to provide that authentication, to provide that proof. So let's look at digital certificates. So with web browsing, we want to do authentication and encryption. To do that, we need to have some secrets shared. To do the encryption, we need to have secrets shared between browser and server. Okay, so if I want to encrypt with AES or triple DES, I'd both sides, the browser and server, need to have a shared secret key. And we can use public key cryptography to exchange a secret key. So how do I get a secret secretly to someone else? We can take advantage of public key cryptography to do that. That is the confidentiality step here. If I want to send a secret from A to B, what I could do is generate a random key, that secret, and encrypt that with B's public key. 
and send that to B. So instead of the message M here, think this is the secret key that A and B are going to use to do the encryption. And the way to do that across an insecure network is to use public key cryptography in the confidentiality mode. But for, for A to send a message to B, it must know B's public key. Okay, so for this part to work, we must know B's public key. And we need to make sure that it is B's public key, it's not someone else's public key. So that's something that we haven't discussed much, is that, okay, public key encryption, we encrypt with someone else's public key. How do I get someone else's public key? Can you tell me? How would I get someone else's public key? How could we distribute public keys? <laughs> put it on Facebook, post it on Facebook. It's your public key. You can put it anywhere. Anyone can see it. Attach in the bottom of your email. Put it in a newspaper article in the old days. Uh, publish it somehow. Okay. So I can publish my public key. Now, your problem then is, how are you sure it's me that's publishing Steve's public key? It's not some malicious user saying, here is Steve's public key, but it's in fact that malicious user's public key. That's the challenge we have. How does someone know that it is indeed that user's public key? Anyone? How do you know? So if I write a public key or I post a public key on my website and say this is Steve's public key and I say download it and use it to encrypt a message to send to me, how do you know someone malicious hasn't put it there pretending to be me? We could try. How would you try to? The way that we'll that we'll use in, in certificates and in general is to get someone else to confirm it is mine, to someone to sign it saying, yes, this public key is in fact Steve's public key. We'll get a trusted person to sign it. And as long as the receiver trusts that third party, then that scheme will work. So what we could do is say, Okay, on my website I put my public key, but I also attach a signature where it's signed by uh, Dr. Tanarak. And you all trust Dr. Tanarak. So when you get it and download and you verify, then you know, ah, since Dr. Tanarak has signed Steve's public key, this must be Steve's public key. So what we need is some other party, we say a third party, to... to to validate or to, to, to vouch for the fact that this is my public key. So we'll see how that w is used in digital certificates. So we need a public key before we can encrypt data. So the challenge is, for example, with HTTPS, if a server sends a public key to the browser, how does a browser know it is indeed the public key of the server and it's not someone pretending or has modified the public key of the server to be someone else? And the way that we achieve that is we get what we call a trusted third party, someone else, to confirm that this public key is the public key of the server. It's not someone pretending to be the server. So let's go through the steps that are involved in doing that for web browsing. And we'll introduce what do we mean by a certificate, and then we'll see some examples. So the, the aim is for the server to get its public key to the browser, and for the browser to be sure that it is the public key of the server. It's not someone pretending to be the server. That's our aim. So there are two steps involved. First, let's assume the server 
the, whoever runs the website, has created their own public key pair, so PUS and PRS, that's the, the public key of the web server and the private key of the web server. And then the server goes to this third party, and this third party we refer to as a certificate authority, and they say, so they may physically go to some organisation, we'll talk about ways that this can be achieved, but they somehow go to some other third party, some trusted person and say, I am this server, I own www.myuni.edu, I own that website, and this is my public key, please certify it. So the server confirms their identity, I'll denote as IDS, the identity of the server, with the certificate authority. And the certificate authority, CA for certificate authority, issues what we call a digital certificate, just a certificate in short. And the way that it does that is it signs the public key of the website, of the web server. So the notation, the, the key information in a certificate is listed here, CS. C for the certificate of the web server. And we'll see that anyone can have a certificate. It contains the identity of the server, the public key of the server. T is a timestamp. We'll see in practice usually the certificate is only valid for a certain period of time say for one year. So some time information saying that this certificate is valid from today, today's date, up until this other date. So that's what I mean by here, T, the timestamp. And then the, that information is signed. IDS, PUST, that information, we calculate the hash of that combined together and then encrypt the hash value with the private key of the authority. So this is the authority signing that information. Coming back to our digital signature, just remember the digital signature, we have some message, that information we want to sign, and we take the hash of that message and encrypt it with the, the signer's private key. So in this case, we encrypt with A's private key. We have the message, which is the identity of the web server, the public key of the web server, and a timestamp. We calculate the hash of all of that, and then it's encrypted with the private key of the authority. And that encrypted portion is what we refer to as the signature, and it's combined with the original message. So the message combined with the signature. And this will denote as the certificate of, a serv of the server. So we say a certificate contains the identity of the server, the public key of the server, a timestamp, and all of that data signed by someone else. And the someone else we're referring to as the certificate authority. Later we'll look at a specific format, so when we send certificates across the internet using HTTPS, they are not just this information, there's some there are standards for the format, and one of them that's commonly used is X509, so I'll show you examples of the exact format, but we'll see it contains this information. So a website obtains a certificate, so when you set up your website, in particular, you want to support HTTPS, you need a certificate. Let's say our website has the certificate, then what happens? When the browser contacts that website, the server responds by sending its certificate to the browser. So CS, the certificate of our server, is sent to the browser, and then the browser verifies that. We can try and draw that. Let's 
C S and The certificate of the server is the identity of the server, the public key of the server, the timestamp, and then we take all of that, those three values, and take a hash of that, and then encrypt with the private key of the authority. So this is this equation. that certificate is obtained when you, someone sets up the server. So it's usually just done once, maybe once a, once a year, for example. We'll talk about that later. And the server stores its own certificate. Remember the aim for HTTPS, the browser needs to get the public key of the s server so that it can use the public key of the server to encrypt values. But it wants to know it's got the public key of the server, not someone pretending to be the server. So we use the certificate to do that. How? Now when the browser contacts the server, and if we remember back to last week, we saw the SSL exchange, and then we saw things like hello messages. And there was a message coming back. And there's a one message that comes back that contains CS, the certificate of the web server. So part of SSL, the secure sockets layer, which is used by HTTP before we transfer the rep web request and response, we do some exchange between browser and server, and one of those packets contains the certificate of the web server, CS. There are other packets as well, but we're focusing on the certificate. What does the browser do when it receives a certificate? What do you do when you receive a signed message? Decrypt, so we verify by decrypting. We check, we verify, we say. So when we receive a certificate, it says, here's the certificate of the web server. Here's the public key of the web server. But the browser wants to be sure, is this really? the certificate of the web server, or maybe someone sent us a fake certificate. Someone modified it along the way. So how do we check? Decrypt using what? Decrypt using the public key of CA. If something was signed with the private key of the CA, to verify we need to have the public key of the CA. So for this to work, the browser must already have the public key of the CA. Draw that. So the browser must have the public key of the CA for, for the verification to work. And think of a certificate as a way to store a public key, but that public key is signed. So the purpose of this CS is to really transfer the public key of the server and to allow someone to verify it's the correct public key. So the browser needs to know the public key of CA for this scheme to work. We'll talk about how it knows it shortly. If they do know the public key of CA, then they can verify, they can decrypt, well not write at all, but decrypt using the public key of CA uh, the signature part. That is this part here, the encrypted hash value. The hash value was encrypted with the private key of CA, so we'll take that signature component 
and decrypt it with the public key of CA and then compare with the hash of the values. So the verification, and we've seen this before, we've, to verify something we decrypt with the public key, we get some value and then compare that value with the hash of the data received. The data in this case is the ID, public key of the server and the timestamp. If they match, verification is successful. If they don't match, it fails. And if, it, if it's successful, what it means from the browser, it means I now have the public key of the website. And I'm confident, I've verified that this public key is in fact of the website, it's not from someone else. How do I know that? Because this certificate authority, this other entity, signed it, confirming it was that of the website. There are a few issues with getting that to work in practice, but before we look at them, any questions on, on the steps there? Right, so there are still some issues of, okay, what do we say? We said the server gets a certificate at the start, and the way they get that is they create their own public key, and the certificate authority signs it. They say, yes, this is the public key of the server. Then using SSL, the certificate of the server is eventually sent to the web browser, and the browser uses the public key of the authority to verify. So the question you're all asking is, where did the public key of the authority come from? How does the browser know that PUCA, the public key of the authority, is in fact the public key of the authority and not someone pretending to be the authority? We have the same problem. But how do we know that... Uh, Let's say the public key of the CA this was from a malicious user, then that malicious user could have signed the public key of the web server, the fake web server. For this to work, we must be sure, the browser must be sure that the public key of the authority is indeed the correct public key. It cannot be that of someone else pretending to be the authority. Because that's the same problem we're trying to solve here. The problem was, how does a browser know that the public key coming from the server is that of the server? And we said, well, we get someone else to sign it. We get the authority to sign it, confirming it is. So we can do the same with the public key of the authority. Get another person to sign this public key CA and confirm this is indeed the public key of the authority. So we could store that public key of the authority in another certificate. So we can think that the authority, and I've got another, the certificate of the CA is the, and it's on the slides, is listed here. The certificate of the CA is the identity, just to say this is who we are, combined with the public key of the authority, some timestamp, combined with the encrypted hash value. The hash of all of that 
That is all those values. On the on the slide, it's it's written clearer, but we just hash the the data here, and we encrypt it with whose private key. When someone signs a message, they encrypt with their private key. Who signs the authority's message? Not the server, not the client. The idea is that the authority signed the server's public key. They said, this is the server's public key. When we sign something, we confirm this is valid. So the authority signed the server's public key. And now we're saying, well, the public key of the authority needs to be signed as well so that we can trust that. So who signs the public key of the authority? Sign your own. That, that's what happens in many cases. Uh, that is, you could sign it yourself, but we have a problem with that because eventually you must tr trust that authority. Another approach is to get another authority to sign. You have a hierarchy. For example, the authority may be an entity, a, a government organisation inside the country. So everyone who creates a website creates their own public-private key pair. They go to that government organisation and the government organisation signs their public key, the public key of the website. But the public key of the government organisation may be signed by some other organisation, maybe a regional organisation or a, a worldwide organisation. So we may have hierarchy of authorities. So there are two options here. The one on the slide is it signs itself. Another option could be it's signed by someone else. The private key, I'll deny it as CA2. A different authority signs this authority's public key. But then we have the same problem. Who signs the public key of CA2? So eventually you need to get to a point where someone will sign their own public key. And that's what I've written on this slide. That is, the public key of the certificate authority was signed by themselves. So this is really saying, the authority saying, here's my public key and I, I vouch for the fact that it's my public key. There's no one else confirming that it's the public key of the authority. So when you receive this certificate, you must implicitly trust it. There's no one else vouching for the authority. But you could have a hierarchy, but eventually you would need some what we call, this is a self-signed certificate. It's the certificate of the CA signed by the CA. They signed it themselves. It's sort of like if you write a recommendation letter for yourself. Okay, you're applying for a job, you need a recommendation letter and you say, I'm a, I'm a, a, a good student signed by myself. When you submit that for your job application, maybe people will not trust it so much. That's what we're doing here. It's a self-signed message. But in this case, we need to do this, otherwise there's no, no end point. If we need to get someone else to sign it, like we had the authority sign the service certificate, then that worked, but then we need someone else to sign the authority certificate. We can do that, but then we need someone else to sign their certificate, and it's uh, never-ending. So eventually, there must be some self-signed certificates, and in practice, there are many. So in our case, if it was signed by CA2, then CA2 would have a certificate. I'm going to remove the two. 
okay, just to go be the same as the slide. So let's say it is a self-signed certificate signed just by the CA. Let's look at this in practice and look at an example when we visited the website and see the certificate and see how it was signed. So the certificate sent using HTTPS, specifically SSL, the CS, follows a certain format and that format is uh, standardised as uh, a standard X509 and we'll look at our web browser and see the certificate that was sent and received by, by my browser. First we'll visit a website, a real one this time. And in this case I'm using HTTPS. Let's see if it works. Okay, so I visit the website and there was no warning in this case. And we'll talk about why that was the, the no warning in the previous case there was. And we see the padlock up here. And if I click on the, it says verified by Starcom Limited. And if I click on it, I can see some more information. And here I can view the certificate. And it's got a summary of the information. And we'll look at the details shortly. We talk about a, a certificate is issued to someone, the, the owner of that certificate, it's issued to them, and it's signed by someone else, so it's issued by someone else. So it's normally, in this case, the certificate is issued to the website or the web server and issued by the authority. So here it summarises the information which is stored inside this certificate. It's issued to www.sandylands.info. So that is the address, the domain name of the web server. So in the, the notation we use, I said IDS, the ID of the web server. In using certificates for HTTPS, the ID is the domain name of the web server. There may be some other information like the organisation, the organisational units, so the company, the, the department and so on. So we may see other examples. Usually that's optional. That the most important thing is the, what's called the common name, which is the, the domain name of the web server. And it was issued by an authority. And the authority in this case is a company called Starcom. Specifically, uh, we may see Starcom has different uh, names or different certificates and it's the Starcom Class 1 Primary Intermediate Server, CA. And the timestamp, I said, was something that indicates the, how long this certificate is valid for. So in this case it begins on the 30th of May last year and it ends uh, next month. So usually certificate, in this case it's valid for one year. And the signature, remember we take the hash of the content and then encrypt it. And this shows some of the, the summary information using the hash of all the data in here. So the SHA value, the SHA fingerprint. But let's look at the details and see the more precise fields in this certificate. So the detail shows us even more. So the certificate, it contains a lot of information. Uh, the version, so this standard has gone through multiple versions. Uh, the certificate has a serial number, so each new certificate can get a different s serial number. The algorithms used, remember we take a hash of the, the content and encrypt it. What hash algorithm? What encryption algorithm? SHA-256 was the hash algorithm and the encryption algorithm was RSA. So we need to know that because it's not fixed. It may be different algorithms used there. So it's stored inside the certificate. 
the issuer is the authority who issued, who signed this certificate. And the, there's a company called Starcom. The validity, the, so the dates, it's not valid before this date uh, nor after this date. The subject is the server, okay, the, whose certificate it is. And CN is the common name, which is the domain name of the web server. The country and other information may be included. So that's the identity of the server. And we also, of course, the main thing is the public key of the server. So that's included here. What algorithm is used for the public key, RSA? What is the public key? If you go back to your lectures on RSA, I think we didn't cover the algorithm in detail, but the public key in RSA is made up of two values, uh, some modulus and some uh, public exponent E. The actual public key is listed here. So if you study how RSA works, you'll, you'll make sense of what that value means. That is the public key. So we have in the certificate the public key of the user of the web server, the identity of the web server, some timestamp. We also have the identity of the issuer, the authority, some information about the, the algorithms used, and extensions are some optional extra fields. Uh, some ID for the certificate, some ID for the um, authority, and We'll not talk about it yet, but we'll see later that sometimes certificates, if there's an error or there's something goes wrong, can be revoked. So some ways for revoking certificates. So they're optional fields. So in this case, and back to the summary information, this is a certificate of the website signed by Starcom. The certificate of the server, so the server in this case, the identity of the server was the domain name and that certificate was signed by the authority so the identity of the CA was the company Starcom. And when that certificate it was sent to my browser, my browser received it and how did it verify? Where my browser received the certificate, how did it verify? Decrypts. Remember, the, the, the certificate is the, the public key of the server signed with the private key of the authority. So to verify, you need the public key of the authority. So when my browser receives the certificate, to verify, what do we need to verify? Which key? The public key of the authority is needed to verify. And in fact, how do we store public keys? We store them in certificates. The role of a certificate is just really to store a public key, but not just the public key, the public key signed by someone else so that we're sure we can prove that it is the correct public key. It's not someone 
uh, sending us a fake public key. So when I say, yes, we verify with a public key of the authority, and with HTTPS, that is represented inside the certificate of the authority. So yes, we verify with the with PU of CA, which is in which is stored in CCA, the certificate of the authority. So if I know the certificate of the authority and I trust it, then I know the public key of the authority and then I use the public key of the authority to verify the certificate of the web server. And if that verifies, I now trust the public key of the web server and that was our aim for my browser to get the public key of the web server and trust it. So where is the certificate of the authority? This is the certificate of the web server signed by the authority. The authority is called Startcom, Class 1 Primary Intermediate Server. Where is the certificate of Startcom? My browser received this certificate. To verify it, it needs the certificate of Startcom. It may be self-signed or it may not, but where is it? Well, let's have a look. In your browser, there's a way to view the certificates that you currently have. If we go to our preferences or the settings of your browser, you'll find usually under some advanced settings, the certificates. And you can view the certificates. And there's different information here, but uh, we'll, we'll come back to these two. This is a certificate of ICT server and my fake myuni.edu website. But we also have a tab for authorities. The authorities are those certificate authorities that my browser currently trusts. And you'll see there are many of them. There's not just one authority in the world that would not be convenient. So there are many different authorities that can sign web server certificates. And we were looking for Startcom. So we scroll down. The Startcom Class 1 Primary Intermediate Server CA. We can open that and view the certificate of this authority. So this is stored inside my browser. For some browsers, it's uh, not stored by the browser. It's actually stored by the operating system. So your operating system may have this database of certificates. We can actually view that one and see that this certificate is issued to Startcom Class 1 Primary Intermediate Server and issued by another authority. Same company, but just a different name here, Startcom Certification Authority. So there is some hierarchy in this case. The web server certificate is signed by Startcom Class 1. Startcom Start Class 1 certificate is signed by the Startcom CA. So there's some form of hierarchy. Where is the certificate for Startcom CA? It's also in the database there. It's this one. This certificate for Startcom CA is signed by Startcom CA and G2. And I think it turns out here's another one. So Startcom CA G2. Uh, is that there? Yes. This certificate, Startcom CAG2, is signed by who? It's signed by itself. Issued to Startcom Certification Authority G2. Issued by Startcom Certification Authority G2. This is what we call a self-signed certificate. 
This is when you sign your own recommendation letter. So in this, this specific instance, there was a, multiple levels in the hierarchy. The web server certificate was signed by one authority, signed by another and another, and eventually the top level was this self-signed certificate. It's just within that organisation Startcom that they have different levels. And um, we'll talk about that, uh, the practical aspects later. Valid for 30 years. Okay. Uh, there are some issues with that. Um, certificates can be revoked. Even though it's valid for 30 years, there's a ways to revoke and say this is no longer valid. But it creates problems if that has to be done. So we talk about a hierarchy of certificates. This is the root of the hierarchy. And we will refer to it as a root certificate authority. So, to finish today, we want to get a public key from web server to web browser. But the web browser wants to be sure it's the correct public key. The reason we want the public key is so then we can encrypt some secret key with that public key. To be sure it is the correct public key of the server, we get someone else to sign it, confirming it is. And that someone else is referred to as an authority, there may be multiple levels of authorities and it finishes at the root level which is a self-signed certificate. What you should do before tomorrow, because it's hard to see on the screen, open up your browser, preferably on a laptop or PC, not on a phone, it's hard to see or hard to access, open up your browser and view some of the certificates. Some of the ones which are may be listed in the servers. It may be different amongst different browsers, but there'll be different types of certificates. These may be some of the websites that you've clicked on trusted. You know, at the first case, we said, yes, I trust this. That added an entry for myuni.edu. It's just temporary. And look especially at the authorities. And essentially, all the certificates listed here means you trust these organisations to sign other people's certificates. And you'll see that there are many of them there. Companies, government, organisations and so on. Have a look through your web browser and see who you trust. And we'll discuss the implications of that tomorrow. <laughs>